Welcome to the Boat Galley Podcast. I'm Lynn Party, here with practical tips, some stories, and some how-tos for your cruising adventure. This episode of the Boat Galley Podcast is sponsored by GoSun.co, inventors of the world's fastest, most compact solar cookers for all your ship-to-shore culinary adventures. Go Sun, using the power of the sun to fuel your galley life. Use coupon code GALLEY2018 to save 10% on any order through December of 2018. Slow down, slow down. What about storms? All sailors, new and experienced alike, worry about storms at sea. At almost every seminar I present, I'm asked questions about the storms I've encountered during more than 200,000 miles of voyaging and delivering yachts with Larry, and as I continued voyaging when Larry required full-time professional care due to dementia and Parkinson's disease. A few months ago, I was contacted by Desiree and Jordan, two young sailors who bought a boat for less than $30,000 U.S., upgraded it, and set off cruising on a very small budget and got going in less than three years. They asked me to be guest on their video blog, Project Atticus. I think their questions about storms were good ones. The answers might help you feel more comfortable about setting off towards a very satisfying new adventure. Your first question. We understand there's a difference between a scary and a dangerous experience. Looking back at your sailing career, what was your scariest experience at sea in a storm? And what was the most dangerous? Well, interesting thing I've learned through my years of voyaging, in fact, years of adventuring, is that the actual management of storms at sea is rarely scary. If you have prepared, if you've had some experience of getting out in heavier winds before you set sail, and if you have a plan and the gear is ready to go. What actually was the most scary thing for me was the anticipation of a storm. Not just what would I do the first time I was in a storm, but I remember in the Indian Ocean, for we had warning that there was a cyclone approaching, although we'd chosen the best possible time to cross the Indian Ocean between Sri Lanka and uh, Malaysia. An unusual storm came through, and for three days we were getting the signs that a cyclone was approaching. First, the barometer started to drop, then unusual currents started to develop, and although the sailing was somewhat pleasant, we started getting a very large underlying swell three days before we actually got into the storm. And those three days of anticipating, of worrying about what were we were going to do, could we avoid it, how bad was it going to be, that was actually the sc- scariest part. When the storm actually hit, and it hit on my watch, uh, we were sailing in about... 12 knots of nice uh, beam reach. And then on watch, I notice a very big squall line approaching. And by the time I got my fall weather gear on, I didn't have time to wake Larry. I got up on deck. I just handled it. We practiced. We'd been in storms before. I had the gear ready to go. Larry heard the commotion. He felt the boat, of course, healing drastically as I was reducing sail. He came out and deck and helped. The scariness was over. It was the anticipation. So all I can say is to avoid being scared by storms, get out in ever heavier winds, check your gear, be prepared. What was the most dangerous? I would say that was off the coast of Australia. We describe it quite carefully in the latest edition of Storm Tactics Handbook. And what made that dangerous is that we had very little room. We depended completely on the parachute anchor to stop our drift to leeward into the 
Coral Sea and the Great Barrier Reef area. There was only 70 to 80 miles of leeway. That was probably the most dangerous. The para anchor did the job. We didn't have major problems with the leeway. We only lost a small amount of leeway in two and a half days in 60 gusting 85. So that was probably the most dangerous. Now, the next question you pose. When you were first started cruising, what did you imagine being at sea in a storm would feel like? And how did that change after your first storm? And after sailing for so many years, how do you now feel about experiencing severe weather at sea? Well, Larry had had quite a bit of sailing experience. He was a professional skipper by the time I met him. He had been practicing heaving too. He'd sailed with some great sailors. He was a real confidence builder for me. My imagination ran wild, but Larry reassured me that we had a good boat under us. Heaving two was the tactic that he planned to use and had used previously. So having that confidence made me feel a lot better. What was my first experience at sea? Well, I thought we were in a storm two days into our voyage. What? Because that was all new to me. I was violently seasick between San Diego and uh, Isla Guadalupe. Uh, but we hove to. I laid down on the cabin sole. I started to feel better. And all of a sudden, the whole idea of storms started being less worrisome. So... How do I now feel about it? I feel very confident in the boats we've sailed on. We've also delivered boats and knowing how to check the gear over, having experienced ever heavier weather, I feel it's a nuisance. Storms are uncomfortable and I don't care how you handle them. They aren't where you want to be. But we, when we sailed around Cape Horn, we had some severe storms. You can't get around there without it. But I had confidence in the boat. And my whole reaction to being hove to for two and a half days off of uh, Tierra del Fuego was, what a bloody nuisance. Thank God I've got some good books. Thank God the lee costs are good and keep us comfortable. We didn't use a parachute anchor at that particular situation because the boat was riding beautifully we just lay hove to and as soon as the wind eased off we headed straight west again to gain lots of lee room lots of room between us and the shores of patagonia number three what are your fam favorite storm tactics the ones we've used to keep us safe We've always relied on heaving two. It's worked really well for us. The amazing thing about it is how it does seem to create a slick and calms the waters to windward so that although the seas don't lay down, the breaking crests don't happen right next to the boat. It's, uh, if you look at our Storm Taxes DVD, it actually shows what a slick looks like. When we were crossing the North Pacific in our little boat, Seraphin, 24-footer, we experienced seven severe storms, the tail of a cyclone. We, Larry got bored with laying hove two and decided to try other methods. We let the boat lie a hull during one storm and we were swept by a sea, damaged the boat. Larry got her hove two and it was as if we would turned the wind off. It's amazing the difference. We've done uh, some other, in other situations, we've run before storms for a uh, little bit too long in one case. And the problem with running before storms is you have to steer the boat and keep it lined up perfectly with any of the waves that are coming under your stern. You have to get an angle coming down the face of them. We actually uh, ended up tipped upside down, quite a bit of damage to the boat. Uh, the minute we think of shortening sail down beyond the full staysail, we heave to. We would never run under bare poles. And it's all explained quite well uh, in our Storm Tactics Handbook how we feel about that. If you've got a big, strong crew who can keep steering, 
through 24, 48 hours of storm. It might be a tactic I'd consider, but I'd also wonder about, do I want water washing through the cockpit? Are my washboards and companionway watertight enough to handle that? So that's why I've answered your question number four, why we would avoid running. Race crews usually are trained to handle running conditions in storms. And uh, the general consensus is 25 to 30 minutes on the helm and storm force winds. That's all a helmsman can handle. So shorthanded doesn't work well. Uh, your next question, you mentioned worrying about the loads that could be imposed on the boat by a parachute anchor. Um, there seems to be a lot of worry about something that isn't a problem. Your gear on your foredeck, that's why we like to use the parachute anchor off the bow and angle the boat so that she's held in a hove to position. The ground tackle exerts more pressure on a, your boat than a parachute anchor should if it's properly sized. But if you look at our um, the most recent edition of the Storm Tactics Handbook, we have done quite a bit of research through the years and feel that people are being sold oversized parachute anchors. Uh, so we've downsized the recommended size for your boat. We dropped down from using a 15 footer, a 12 footer, excuse me, we had a 12 footer on Talos and we found that it was actually bigger than it needed to be. An eight footer did perfectly well. So if your parachute anchor is not oversized, if you are securing your road to a bollard on the foredeck or you're uh, using your windlass as a support, it should be more than strong enough. Remember, there's never the full weight of that, your boat going onto that parachute. Your boat's floating. If you get 5% of the weight of the boat thrown onto that parachute, it's probably a lot. It's just identical to being at anchor in extreme winds. Your last question, have we ever used a Jordan series drogue or something similar? No, we have not, although we have spoken to many people who do. Just about anything dragged off the bow of your boat will help the boat stay hove too, and it'll stop it and keep it the way you want to lie, which is about 50 degrees off the wind that you have to put a bridle on it. But if you're using a St Jordan series drogue off the stern, once again, you're in a running position. You're putting your stern towards the wind. You're putting that cockpit towards the stern. I'm not comfortable with that. The one problem I've heard with people using this Jordan series drogue is getting it back in is really, really difficult. So I hope I've given you a few answers here. It's a complex problem. I think people worry about storms more than they should. In all of our sailing with when Larry and I sailed together, 200 and some thousand miles together, we delivered a lot of boats for people. We did sail around all four of the great southern capes. So we had stormier weather than the average cruiser would face. And still, we were only in winds above 30 knots. 6% of our voyaging time. And if you just take the deliveries out and take the Cape Horns sort of things out, probably 2% of our time was in winds over 30 knots. And not all of that was storms. And many of it was just uncomfortable sailing. I'm currently sailing on a boat called Sahula with a very lovely gentleman named David Haig. And uh, because Larry's no longer with me, he's in full-time care due to his very advanced dementia. David sailed around the world 11 years, and the first time he was in winds above 35 knots was just a few weeks ago off the coast of New Zealand. So around the world by choosing the best seasons. So, But on the other hand, you do still have to prepare for that time when a storm catches you out. So get out sailing as much as you can. And when the winds are blowing up 
instead of heading back into port, turn around, go to windward into that wind, and practice using that storm trysail. Practice reefing your sails. The more often you go out into winds that are heavier, the less strong winds will concern you. So, fair winds and hope you have some good sailing. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please be sure to subscribe in your podcast app. And reviews are always appreciated. Music